this piece of water we're gonna fish. It's a thicket. The casting is very demanding in this tight brush. I don't think that this cast and this type of fishing has ever really been recorded. Control. If we can capture this on film today, it will be a highlight. This is not going to be an easy day, but it's going to be a great one. a brook trout in all its wriggle beauty. It's, it's, it's gold to me. Eighty-six years old. Eighty-six years young. It took me about two and a half years to write this book. And so many times when I was writing that book, I hit the wall. And the way I got around that, I just picked up the fly rod, head for the stream, work a patch of water, and said, oh, this is what I want to say. I'm a professional fly fisherman here in central Pennsylvania. And these streams are some of my favorites to fish in all of the world. I've been fishing since I was six years old. From that moment on, I have lived, breathed, taught, and competed in the wonderful sport of fly fishing. Fly fishing is a form of fishing where instead of using live bait like worms, you mimic bugs with materials such as fur and feathers. The fly is cast into the water with a fly rod and propelled by the weight of a line. Wasn't that neat? That is beautiful. After 80 years, I can't imagine doing anything else. You ready? Whoa, that's a nice fish. Might as well get this, because Ranger Rick, if I still have that fish, I'm going to get him one way or the other. When I hook a big fish or I hook a fish at night or any time I'm fishing and, and I get into a fish, the little boy comes back. <laughs> All right, get off. Oh. That was a big brown trout. Brown trout about that long. That was a brown trout about 14 inches. 
Oh, well. But it's no coincidence that my life has always been enchanted by a beautiful creature that's tough to catch, a fish. Fly fishing, my livelihood. I've taught thousands of students over a period of many years. I will continue to teach until I finally reach the bottom of that mountain. My dad has accomplished so much in his life, and he is really famous in the fishing world. Almost every place we go or any place we travel, we will meet people who know him. He's fished in pretty much every state in the U.S., and that includes Alaska. He's done world championships. He's traveled all over the world fishing. But my dad does everything when it comes to teaching fly fishing. My purpose and intent of this video is to have you enjoy this sport to its fullest. The back two fingers pulled. He did the first fly fishing series ever on ESPN. Fly Fishing Journal with your host, Joe Humphreys. Today in Fly Fishing Journal, I have with me my special guest, George Harvey. George and I have been fishing many years together, and it's a real, real pleasure for me to have my mentor on the stream with me. On this spring spring. We'll meet people who will say, I learned so much through watching his video. Fish was along with me this morning. Maybe we can catch a couple fish. Maybe we can get really lucky and catch three. Or his books meant everything to me when I was growing up. He does fly fishing shows, clinics. When I'm through with this demo, you'll be so screwed up, you won't know which end of the rod to hold. So that's, that's fair warning. I always think there's nothing left to do, but he always says there's that one more book in him. There's one more video in him. There's always something else that can be done. To me, one of his biggest contributions is all the charity work he does. Do I have all my little students here? Yes. Hello. Hello, dear. For him, it's not about fame or glory. He feels that he's been given this gift, and he needs to give it to other people. What happens to people if they don't have proper instruction and they don't have any direction and they try it unsuccessfully on their own? Frustrations build, I'll try golf. When you have instruction and, and nothing succeeds like success and you say, whoa, this is kind of fun. When you catch a fish, you're off and running. You never forget it. Are those just sticks? Second right. That he glued together? Stream, you know, That's a caddis. Oh, it is a mm -hmm. caddis. Mm -hmm. Who would have ever thought oh my that that little fellow would have built that complete house of sticks? He was amazing to go hike with, and I guess I thought everyone's dad was this way. Mm -hmm. He would be able to tell you whatever tracks you saw, what animal it was, That's or cool. respect of nature. Everyone's dad was like that? Oh, I thought everyone's dad was <laughs> like that. And then I realized other people's dads were in office buildings in the summer right. and not doing those kind of things. But... You got a bright future, huh? Thank you very much. Good. What got me hooked on fly fishing? The interest, it was almost innate. It was there. I was bored with it. I've always felt strongly about it, a piece of water, a stream, like it's almost running through my system, my body, and I think that started at such a tender age. I loved to play in the water. I loved to wait in the water. I loved to look for things in the water. And so it was just a natural. It all started when my father moved us from Kervinsville, Pennsylvania. This house was my family home. And in that second floor, where we were all born. And I was born January 19th, 1929. Those are the Depression years. My father had lost his job in the bank. They were hard years. So in 1935, we moved to State College because my father wanted his children to be educated. And he got a job in the bursar's office at Penn State University, and my life changed. But that's where it started. That moved. There was a weird twist of fate. Yes, I got my BS degree and, and a master's in education, and it's what I wanted to do. But little did my father realize that he also gave me my livelihood. 
State College was the mecca of fly fishing. Because of Fisherman's Paradise, a piece of Spring Creek developed in 1934 for fly fishing only. This was the first all fly fishing project in the United States, if not the world. With this piece of water, fly fishing was something to learn about and something to do. We have more trout streams in Pennsylvania than I think any other state in the Union other than Alaska. Central Pennsylvania is limestone country. Not only is the area rich in nutrients, the runoff from the mountains, the hills, the freestone streams go down into the valleys. A lot of the streams go underground and come up as major springs. Uh-huh. Clear, cold, top of the mountain water. Your trout population, their metabolism demands temperatures into the 50s, 60s to survive. This is why we have such wonderful trout waters in the area, because of the beautiful big springs that keep our waters clear and cold. The mountains, the streams, the resources were so wonderful. And so the State College area was an important aspect of my life. We are going after some cold spring water. That water is absolutely delightful. And that's what I have in my coffee. That's my coffee water in the morning. It's cold spring water that comes right out of the mountain. Nothing added. I can't find any better water than what I have right here. And off we go to the happy land. We are now following the mainstream of Spring Creek. My father took me to Spring Creek when I was a child. I was six years old. Neither of us had ever fished or picked up a fishing rod. We were fishing worms with bamboo fly rods. And my first cast, the worm luckily landed in the water. And then I felt a tug and I pulled and out came a trout and it flew up over my head and landed in the weeds behind me. That didn't take long. I was so excited, and lo and behold, there was an eight-inch trout, a native brown. I was just in awe of the beauty of that fish, the halos, the spots. So this is the beginning. And after my first experience with my father, it was a quest. There's another one. It really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to fish. You might say that I was self-taught. My early efforts were very clumsy, but I had the patience of Job. This is where I caught some of my very first trout. I guess you could call this one of my major classrooms. When I was probably eight, 10, I would get on my bicycle, fly rod across a handlebar, and I would pedal, pedal to Thompson Run. Thompson Run this is a tributary to Spring Creek. There was so much I learned from Thompson Run. I would view trout, Watch them feed readily. Where they went, how they lifted, how they positioned themselves. It was like they were laying out a plan for me. How would I capture these fish? How could I catch one of these? The most amazing thing to me about what Joe has done, 79 years ago, there was no internet. There were no videos. There wasn't a library of books to learn Some from. Childhood pictures. This guy has figured it out on his own. Let's take a look at these. I tell a story about catching this fish on a Thompson run, and I had tried to catch his trout at earlier times, and he disappeared through my clumsiness. After the last time I spooked that fish, I waded into the water, and I grabbed a handful of vegetation, and it was alive with freshwater shrimp. And some of these shrimp had a little touch of orange on them. I found some orange sewing thread in my mother's sewing basket and with some fur and that sewing thread, I fashioned what I thought was something that looked like it. I went back to the stream, got into position, made the cast, and the fish traveled a few feet for that fly. It was a 14-inch fish, one of the biggest I had ever taken. Now I knew they took the fly underneath as well as on top, and this is called nymphing. I pedaled my bicycle home with that prize, and my mother took a picture of that fish the trout streams of State College. They were my classroom, my playground. They're like coming home. I still live in State College because on my 25 mile radius, there's several streams you can fish. But all are special little waters that have a lot of memories for me.
Henge Creek, Fishing Creek, and the little Juniata. Thompson Run down here and, and Spring Creek. Oh, donuts this morning. Donuts this well, morning. thank you. How do you like that coffee this morning? Wonderful, as always. But Spring Creek is my lifeline. Spring Creek flows 22 miles from a source near my home in the mountains of the Tussie Ridge and its confluence with the Bald Eagle Creek in Milesburg. Spring Creek means everything to me. It's my childhood, my parents, and my siblings, but also my wife and children. Gloria and I raised our family on this stream because it runs behind my property. I have two wonderful daughters, Johanna and Dolores. And Dolores, she was in one of my ESPN shows with me. And featuring special guest, Dolores Humphreys. I guess the last time we were together really and spending much time on the stream at all is when you had my uh, angling class at Penn State University. That's right. He went out west for a time after high school and helped build the Million Dollar Highway in Colorado. And he fished the Dolores River. I'm even named after a river, and Johanna is named after him. Both girls have made me so proud. Little Johanna being a track champion. I don't have the fishing connection with my dad. I have the athletic connection. We're both pretty strong-willed and pretty stubborn, and it's always been a competition. Even as a kid, he would challenge me to races in the yard, you know, because he really wanted to beat me. He's a character. The secret of my longevity is whole milk. I drink milk like it's going out of style. I've never had a broken bone, and I've been in every kind of undesirable situation. No broken bones. And then I ate a lot of fish in my life. When I was a kid, I fished a lot, and that's what we ate. This is the Joe Humphreys. We're hungry. We threw a trout in the pan. <laughs> we cook it, we eat it. Here's my trout sandwich. Yummy. Life is good. No tattoos. No, I never had a tattoo, but I have something of that fashion, I guess you might say. So I have a golden trout in my tip. How old were you when you got that? Oh, who knows? Probably in my 60s. <laughs> and then there's Denny. My sister and I rely on Denny now as an even bigger part of my dad's life. Denny is the brother that we never had. Denny is like my son. We're so close. He was fishing on our stream many years ago and did not see the no trespassing sign, and he met my mother. Fast forward a dozen years later, and he is someone that's incredibly important to our family. Because of Gloria, I get to fish with Joe. We get to go to dinner with the girls, spend Christmas together. Our families are very close. A lot of people have asked me over the years, summarize Joe as a fly fisherman. It's almost impossible. Throw him on a small mountain stream. You got no room to cast, and he throws a humpy up in there and takes an eight-inch brook trout. Yay. The same day, you could go to a big limestoner here in central Pennsylvania, and he'll drift nymphs down on the bottom and pick fish off the bottom. I said I'm going to take another one before I get out of there. There's one. There's one. That's, that's a better, better fish. fish. Yeah, that's what I want. Kind of boy, huh? go out that night at 2 in the morning in the dark of the moon, and he'll swing big wet flies and catch a behemoth. Yeah, I have it, you sucker. <laughs> Can you get him in there? He's in there. It's a good fish. It's a nice big fish. Yeah. I think the old man can't still catch fish. Yeah. <laughs> I've been a fan of his since caught his state record brown trout in the dark. Go ahead and tell us the state record. Oh, the story? Yeah. It's late evening. I'm fishing a big, long, deep pool. And I hear a tremendous explosion, and it went stone quiet. I knew it had to be a heck of a fish. I almost got a divorce over this one because I stalked the fish for three years, going night after night after night. Gloria sang, you're fishing, and I told her about this fish. One night, my telephone rang, and it was my buddy Al Hag. And he said, hey, Hump, I'm antsy. Why don't you go fishing? I'll just go along. And I said, OK, Al. So I went back to the pool. And I went down through the first time, and I took a pretty nice fish, 18, 19, and it was OK. But I was excited. It's now it's 1 in the morning. He said to me, don't you think it's time to go home? And I said, just let me run this top end just one more time. And I chucked those two flies across that stream in that backwater, and I gave them a little tip and get those flies in motion. And all at once, they stopped, and the rod tip goes, oh. 
It sounded like somebody rolled a wash tub over, and I put the hammer to this fish. It was just almost out of line, and I stopped the fish on the run. I had no net, and that wouldn't have landed that fish anyhow. And Alice said, oh, my God, I've never seen a fish this big. I said, neither have I. I think I've got a record. So the ward measured it with a 16-pound, 34-inch brown trout. The previous record was 33. For 11 years, it was Pennsylvania's record trout. It is still the fly-caught record brown trout, or trout in Pennsylvania, and probably a lot of states. That's the story of the big fish. I think of that fish often, but I've always wanted a 20-pound brown. That's been my drive through life. I want a world record, and this is one reason that I really got into the night game. Thank you, sir, okay, very you much. Bet. God bless. See you, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Joe, he's famous for night fishing. You've got some fans. Night fishing to me is one of my favorite games. It's when the heavyweights come out to feed. Your big trout, world record fish, they're nocturnal. These two patterns, are, I call them uh, my stonefly patterns. These flies are big, they move water. They represent large insects like a stonefly. We're gonna go give these a try and see if we can't find something larger than a foot long. So here we go. Uh, follow the, the blind here. Danny. Here's a tip for anybody fishing at night. Never go on a stream that you don't know after dark because it can be very dangerous. You can lose your life. So what, 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 watch these thistles, huh? Night fishing, it's not for everybody. I mean, it's tripping and falling, getting lost. Snakes. Joe has a great story about stepping on a rattlesnake, whacking his waders in the middle of the dark. It's not as easy as he makes it look. It is a lifetime of work that he's put into this. Your casting stroke and your casting ability comes to play. Okay, lights out. It's called pinpoint casting in darkness. You have to know when to squeeze that stroke off to get back under those trees and next to that bank. And if you don't spot that fly in a very few inches, it's difficult to take them. I got a big fish. Oh, I got a fish. Let's go on. When you have the take of a large <laughs> fish at night, you feel that heavy weight and, a, and the power of a fish. It's really exciting because you don't know on the take how big that fish is. It could be 20 inches. It could be 20 pounds. Are you, are you getting any of this battle? Are you getting any of this? You want to see a big fish at night? There's a big fish at night. <laughs> That's called credibility. Don't talk about it if you can't do it. Good job, Joe. <laughs> Yay. How about that? Huh? What a day. <laughs> the fact that you become known for some expertise in your field, that's wonderful. But I think as a teacher, you want to be as well versed as you possibly can. You owe it to your students. I have traveled extensively and I've had the privilege of working with so many people and teaching so long, and I'm still so busy teaching. Any given week, he's gone at least three quarters of the week teaching a class. July still has a couple open dates, and August still has a couple open dates, but otherwise, this entire schedule book is filled. I'm moving all the time, going so many different places. When you get old, you think old, you're old. At 86, that's just a number. How many miles do you think you drive in a month? Mm, it's hard to say. I have a hard time saying no to a lot of good causes. What I don't like is driving to Somerset, New Jersey. Eh. It's called Demolition Derby. OK, everybody, pull in with the old man. Back to basics. I am a left-hander, so I drop down on my right knee. I will need help getting back. The reason I'm on my knee is because I want my arm out of the game. We're going to let the rod work. We're going to lift up into it, stop it, and tap it. Push your thumb down, and we're casting. That little pressure, pushing the thumb down here, now you don't throw tail and loose. I'm one of the few guys in the profession that don't mind going on a stream and working for fish in front of people. Joe makes fly fishing look so easy. He's never failed taking fish with us, and we put him in some extreme conditions during a 22 year. To be stewards of a strand, you're trout. gonna practice catch release. There's your first little trout of the year. Hold on, I'll have another one. I don't like to handle a fish. Now, I know there's times 
you got to show your buddy that fish. But you don't have to handle it, though. How many in here have never caught a fish? How many in here want to catch a fish? <laughs> You're at the right place at the right time. The Jesse Arnell group of children are mostly from the cities. We never got a chance to fish and enjoy the great outdoors. A good one. Oh, it would be a good day if everybody caught a fish. This is my first time fishing. My dad fishes all the time, so I wanted to give it a try. We got him. Ooh. We got a fish. Oh. This is fantastic. This is amazing. Whoa. Look at this. Wow, your first trout? My first trout. Oh, what a beauty. Look at the pretty colors. Yes. Oh. oh my gosh, this is just amazing. Yay. I'm just like in a whole nother space. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's my first That's fish. That's how I felt. My first fish. I hope teaching these kids something about what the environment means to all of us. And they saw the beauty of this world around them, the beauty of the fish that they caught. Without clean water in which these fish live, we're in bad shape. You got a challenge. You got to take care of these streams that you so enjoy, and you got to take care of this land, because there's a hell of a lot of people out there that won't protect it. Here's one right here. That's awesome. That's a polyphemus moth. Yeah, that's a good one. Today I'm working with the Brookie School. These children, they are learning the ins and the outs of conservation, the aquatic insects within the waters, and what they mean to the trout and its survival. I would have loved to have had that opportunity. It took me 80 years to figure out the same thing that these kids are learning in one week. Whoa, there's a nice big sculpin. You know, that's, that's strawberry shortcake for a trout. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, me too. Have you heard of Joe Humphreys before? Yes, I have. I've actually seen his display in the Fly Fishing Hall of Fame down in Boiling Springs, and uh, it's definitely a great honor to be with a real living legend, the brook trout. serve as fabulous bio-indicators for a lot of our mountain streams and cold water streams here in Pennsylvania. They're very sensitive to pollution. I mean, a lot of the same streams that these brook trout are inhabiting are the same streams where we get our drinking water from, so they really do serve as an early detector of poor water quality for us. How does it make you feel to see these kids so excited? I mean, it has to remind you of you, right? Oh, it does. It, it, it takes me back to my childhood, and, and my feet would not have touched the ground for probably a month. I would have been so excited. So, yeah, I understand these kids. I understand where they're coming from. When I was a young lad, I did not enjoy going to school. Fisticuffs, yes. Hard knocks, yes. I became a problem. Fishing was the catalyst that moved me from the depth of despair into a whole new life. The Christmas of 1941, my parents, being so frustrated with their son, bought me a book called Just Fishing, written by Ray Bergman. Just Fishing by Ray Bergman, Fred Everett. That book turned my life around. I wrote this so that nobody would steal my book, and I even have my phone number. <laughs> this very first chapter, was so influential. My first experience trout fishing dates back to the year of 1903 when I was a boy of 12. I saw my first living trout at a brook. I had been wandering through the woodlands near my home and by some chance had approached a pool of a small brook without disturbing its occupants. As I looked over the bank, I saw six spotted beauties fanning their fins in the cool, clear water. The sight of those fish reacted on my nervous system strangely. I did not know what they were, but some latent instinct within my being informed me that they were game to be prized highly. Now, if the teacher would ask me to write a paper, now I had some direction. And I would write maybe about the brown trout, or I'd write about how to fish the wet fly. Even look, I even put little X's where these flies were because those are the flies I thought were important and those are the ones I wanted to tie. And he had the real basic fundamentals he had within these pages. I learned from this. That book gave me a new start in life. Hopefully, my books, I hope maybe they give somebody direction. I'm most proud of my dad for who he is to other people. It's not just that he's this famous fisherman. Somebody can say to me, my son got to meet your dad for 10 minutes and it was a wonderful experience. And that sums it up of who he is as a person. Kids are the future on this wonderful sport. Morning. Look at these guys right here. This is a tough crew right here. <laughs> Somebody told me you took 47 fish yesterday, is that right? Me? 
Pennsylvania. <laughs> Who, me? Today, I'm, I'm Lamar, Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful sight up here. To teach the youth fly fishing team. You don't need heavy diameters if you're cast right. What you have to have is line and leader control. So that's where we start. You have to adjust for everything you do. These children, in the last two years, they've won the world's championships. All right. We're ready to go. You gotta remember, I'm a left-hander. There's legendary people in the sport of, of fly fishing, and Joe's one of the last ones that is around, still helping, still doing things. You know what he's talking is legit, and it's gonna work. These kids are really tuned in. They're so fun to teach. I want that rod to stop right up and down. 12 o'clock. Joe is phenomenal. He is just upbeat, wants you to learn as a fly fisherman, wants you to get better. Stay here with me. He's going to do anything he can to make you better. OK, here we go. Now, this is where the game changes. On a bow and arrow cast, your fly should always be seven inches below your handle. He teaches us. There's your roll cast. But then we teach everybody else. And you may talk to a guy who lives in North Carolina, who lives all the way in California, but they know his methods from somebody who learned it from somebody who learned it from him. It just keeps getting passed down. When he does something, he wants to do it well, but he really has so many different talents. He boxed for the Navy and at Penn State. And here's something a lot of people don't know. He was a very good ice skater, and he taught advanced ice skating as a phys ed course at Penn State. When my mother taught beginning ice skating. So at any given time, you could go up to the rink and find both of them teaching a class. He actually was in an ice show where he did an ice dance with his fishing rod, and which was amazing. Joe Humphreys. There's nothing he doesn't do, even at 86, even when he's tired. He is still in better shape than most people I know who are in their 40s and 50s. And pretty much every morning, he'll go down in the basement and do his crunches and his push-ups. He calls it, I believe, pump and steel. I still pump steel. I work out. Don't sit and watch the tube. Stay busy. Move. When I was fighting, I was trained with rope. It's not a surprise, I think, that he's still as agile physically as he is, because he did all of these sports. Like I said, it wasn't a passing fad. It wasn't a membership at a gym for a year. This was a way of life. He taught almost every phys ed course there was at Penn State, including racquetball, weightlifting, personal defense, judo, and bowling. I mean, he was a really good wrestler, too, and wrestling coach, and was well known for that as well. He wrestled for Penn State and in the Navy. He's already inducted in the United States Wrestling Hall of Fame. He still goes into the room today because he was Penn State's assistant wrestling coach. All right, now use that strength. These arms have reeled in a few fish, probably Are you 10. ready? Are you ready? You say 10 fish? I can't give you that, not with the camera on this. <laughs> These are my heroes. Cale Sanderson, Casey Cunningham, Jake Varner, Cody Sanderson. Dang, not only the finest coaches in this nation today, they're teaching these kids moral values. They're teaching them how to face life. What you do on the mat as a coach or a teacher in the classroom extends far beyond the mat or the classroom. It extends into their lives. I uh, wrestled for Joe Humphreys from 1965 to 69. OK, Grant, you're here. You're si sitting down. That is a great shot. Monumental man in my life. He came in at a time when we needed some direction. Direction I was on I was quitting school. If you guys wouldn't have wrestled today, I would have been going to say, now, I wonder what cell the Packers are in. Yeah, sure. well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I look at him and I think it should have been three of them. This man changed my life. And he said, you're going to be a great one. Started me in a direction that was so powerful that even when I made the wrong choice, his word stayed with me. I give him credit all the time. I think my dad has always followed his calling. They were different things at different times, and he has always known that fishing is what his life's work is to be. Choosing between wrestling and fly fishing, it was a decision that I knew would really affect my life. Fishing was, I guess you might say, was in my blood. I 
would never discard it. I would never, it was always there, it had to be there. But when I found out that I could make money in the fly fishing world collegiately as an instructor at Penn State, there was no choice. I gave up wrestling and continued in the fly fishing world. My mentor, George Harvey, he was a hero. He was an angler that had more insights than anybody, I think, in the United States or the world. He created a tuck cast that got the nips to fish. He created fly tying clinics. He was a pioneer. I learned so much from him. And we were also great friends. When George Harvey retired from the angling program at Penn State in 1970, then I chose to go that direction and teach the fly fishing courses at Penn State University. Penn State Angling class started as a non-credit class in 1934. It was not an accredited class until 1947. And I was there 19 years. How lucky I've been to make the love of my life my profession. There, that's a great shot. With fly fishing, you're imitating insects. You're imitating the food chain in which the trout feed upon. This is a helgramite. That's a larva stage of an insect and is lunch and dinner for a trout. How many aspects of this fly fishing game are there? So many. This is a stone fly that has two wing cases and two tails. This nymph that you see right now, they crawl from the stream bottom, crawl up on the vegetation or on the rocks and fly away. There are so many insects that they inhale. This is a caddis pupa, C-A-D-D-I-S. They build this case around them, and it's an amazing thing. We can tie these, imitate them, and they catch fish. He's whiter and not lighter, and so the fly that I'm imitating is the dark part is the case, and the little white is the head coming out like the caddis is crawling out. This is a good imitation. That's another part of the game that's so, so much fun is that you can find the stuff in the bottom of the rocks, and then you go back to the bites and you tie a fly, tie and you tie until you get exactly what you think it is, and then you go out and try it and it works. Did you catch a fish on something that you made with your own hand to imitate a glorious little insect? It's a great feeling. Isn't nature wonderful? When I'm fishing with people, one thing I say to them, at one point during the day, look up. You've been staring at the water from the moment we made the first cast. I like to stop and live the moment. One of the most beautiful sounds in the spring to me is a red-winged blackbird and its song. Or it can simply be the change of the clouds above. It can simply be the sun reflecting on a log. And those are cherished moments. The good Lord has given us such a beautiful place to fish. When you don't take time to recognize and enjoy it and appreciate it and be thankful, then you're missing part of the game. This was a grist mill built back in 1822. I picked it up 50 years ago, tried to put it back together, but it's most unique because it has the water running underneath the living room through a pond with trout in it. I love it. My brother Dick lived in the adjoining property, and I thought how nice someday it would be to be with my brother and restore that old mill. Ah, what a guy he was. He was in the Merchant Marine in World War II. But when he came back, we started to fish together. We started to do things together. We called each other the brothers and he was instrumental in helping me with this home. At the tender age of 47, he was killed in a tractor accident in the field adjacent to me, and it was a terrible loss. He missed his brother terribly, and his mother died when he was only about college age, and he was very close to his mother. So he gets very upset easily with death, and it's easy for us to all say, oh, well, you have all of us, we're all still here, but you know, having his wife go before him, which he never, ever thought would happen, he never thought would happen, and they never planned for that. It wasn't supposed to happen. 
He was five years older. They were both in great shape. So he's having a very hard time still after a year accepting that she's gone and, and going on without her. Yeah. Gloria, my wife, we had 56 wonderful years. We were on a camping trip. It was on the Loyal Sock River. And I'm helping her up on a boulder with me. Without her, I would have never developed into any kind of a man. And she was my strong right arm. She is the driving force. She is my agent. She is just about everything. She fished too. When he proposed to her, only Joe Humphreys would do this. He put the ring in a fishing license and I believe presented it to her that way. She figured out a long time ago that if you can't beat him, join him. And she knew that there was no holding him back and that that was his passion and that she was by his side quite a bit on the stream. My mom, she just was this shining star and she brought out the best in all of us. I was so lucky. The memories come back so strong. Just stay there and read or whatever time, just fall asleep. And I thought, I have to do something. I, I, you know, I have, as she said, focus on something. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. Bands are playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. Somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Gloria died uh, a year ago, May 20th. It was a hard day acknowledging the year mark that she left us. It was appropriate to be at the inn because we had been there with her shortly after her diagnosis. The Aaronsburg Inn is where Denny and I stayed when we fished Penns Creek each year. Denny and I were there when we found out that Gloria had cancer and she can't be cured. It was gone too far. And so I had a bit of a breakdown the last time we were there. Enough of that, okay? With Gloria passing, there's me trying to provide support to Joe now. Ironically, I think most people, including myself, would have looked at getting out on a stream as being a part of the healing process. And initially, Joe withdrew. He did not want to be on a stream. He did not want to fish. He was, it was, he was suffering too much. Then I got the phone call. Let's go fishing. The secret of life is having something exciting to look forward to. That is the secret of life. And fly fishing is that. You're going fishing. Ninety percent of the time when we fish together, I'm not fishing. I'm just standing next to him. <laughs> Why would I possibly want to be 50 feet down the stream doing my thing Very nice, huh? when the living legend is right there? Yay. Yay. Hey.
I'll tell you, we couldn't have had a better start than we did today. <laughs> yeah, it was a great half yeah. hour. Boy. There is a sense of healing with fly fishing, and this sport has come back to help him heal, too. This is one of the last stands of virgin timber in central Pennsylvania. It's one of my favorite spots. I'm a tree hugger. These were the game trails, and those were the trails that the Indians followed. These trails later on became roads, highways. I love the sound of this little stream. I love the, the sound of the water. It's therapy for me. How picturesque, how beautiful. What a gift to be here, just to witness this. Let's see. It's almost hot dog time. It's getting closer and closer. Cheers. Cheers, honey. Pretty amazing lunch spot. Yeah. I've had lunch here with Gloria, and uh, we've had some memorable times here. Walk the forest trail and reminisce and plan our future and talk about the good times and what adventures we may find ahead of us. And the moral of the story is enjoy your mate as much as you can while you can. Because it can go quickly. very lucky to have lived this long. So I'm very happy to face another day. Uh, Jack, Joe Humphreys, we're going to end Craig to shoot for the veterans today. Okay, talk to you later. How do you do that? I fail at night. That's why I don't fish at night by myself much anymore. I'll take this along. That dries, hope it works. Out of here. I have volunteered with Project Healing Waters for many years, and there are many chapters and units. They'll be having breakfast, but they won't want to get down on the stream too early with this fall. Okay. Up, All right. my there voice yeah. I made it. This is hard to see, but that's the flak jacket I was wearing when I got shot. My buddy took that picture. Whoa. Thank God you're here. Thank God you're all here. Fly fishing is the greatest therapy in the world. These waters and the fish they're catching within, it's a healing process. The fly fishing for me has been a way for me to, to concentrate and to focus on, on something because I have a very active and racing mind with PTSD and it's hard for me to relax. I can get out of uh, a bad state of mind and reel myself back in. When did you get into this game? When I was 10 years old. Uh-huh. My father introduced me to it. Oh, neat. You had some good times with your dad. Yes, sir. Isn't that wonderful? Let it drift. Pull! Ha, ha, ha! I see another one. Ah, ha, ha. All right, all right. We're, we're waiting to eat rocks. Think how many thousands of years they've been there. Oh, my God. Now you might have to adjust your cast a little bit. One of the things that really help you on this, the rod tip doesn't go far. It just goes way up high. It's just two inches, OK? And then I shock it, then I drop it, and it just stacks it. Then it's just floating on its own. All that leader is doing the job for me, OK? Catch me a fish. tear my fingers to pieces, but I don't care. You have us. You just made my whole... You made my whole year. Oh, Joe. Whoa. You see the way he smashed that. Oh. He just, and you'd never think that that piece would hold a fish, would you? That's Pen's great. Trick. Yeah. On a dry fly. Thank you so much. Oh, Georgie, I am having a 
time of my life. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> this is a day I will never forget. Slowly serving the earth and you are in heaven. They're excited about a murder. Excitement's found. Sometimes I feel that the streams and the rivers run through me. And the flow of the waters, it's been my soul. It's been my heart. And I want to protect them. In Pennsylvania, the top industry is agriculture. The second is tourism. People come to Pennsylvania to fish our beautiful streams, hunt in our woodlands, and enjoy the beauty of Pennsylvania. Economically, it's smart to save what we have. And fly fishing is a big part of it. All of these streams bring people from all over the world to fish here. And unfortunately, there's so many threats that are facing the streams. They drive for the Marcellus Shale and the disruptive activities of strip mining can ruin a lot of waters. It's a never-ending battle, and we have to stay on our toes to keep our waters clean. Here's the thing about Joe. He's Mr. Conservation, as far as I'm concerned. Anything that comes off the roads gets dumped right into here, which right. gets dumped into the duck pond, which gets dumped into Thompson Run. Which dumps into Spring Creek, right? will improve habitat in the stream, but if we don't get a handle on stormwater and the If you don't have a water elevated... quality, you, what, what good right. is habitat? Right, exactly. You don't have any trout. Exactly. My major conservation effort is Thompson Spring and the duck pond. This is why they call Spring Creek, Spring Creek. There are a myriad of streams along its course. This is one of the main ones. Thompson Run is a big, beautiful spring. It is a major producer of cold water that gives Spring Creek its life. And this is Thompson Spring that comes right out of the bowels of the earth, right up through in here. This is the future of Spring Creek right there. Just adjacent to it is a pond called the Duck Pond. The Duck Pond is a storm sewer runoff holding pond. You have chemicals, mercury, oils, every contaminant imaginable that flows from the streets of State College and surrounding areas going into the duck pond. In the early 50s, they relocated the highway, and that relocation pushed Thompson Spring into the duck pond, pushing all of that contaminated water into Spring Creek. See where the arrow is, the turning arrow? That's where the stream was. We had brook trout, brown trout. When it rained, we'd run into the iron furnace and get out of the rain. So it's hard to believe that the trout stream was there, not here. They just took the whole thing and just shoved it. The water temperature started to climb to in the 80s and 90s, killing the fish. Spring Creek went down as a major trout producer and as a viable great fishery. Seeing its demise was heartbreaking because I had so many wonderful childhood memories. I couldn't stand it. And so I said, can, what can I do myself? What can one man do? In the early 70s, I pulled five guys together we sat at this table right here and formed Spring Creek Trout Unlimited. We determined that we would divert that big spring back around the duck pond. We are at the top of the duck pond. What you're seeing right here is the diversion as it goes up the whole way paralleling the duck pond. And to the right is the spring, the water from the spring coming down through into the Thompson Run. It was a nightmare to divert Thompson Run. This concrete wall is what we had. You can see the thickness of it here. With an air hammer, a jack hammer, we punched a hole through it. Then I needed a huge pipe to go through the hole that we were making to divert the spring. The water flows through and comes down the other side. Spring Creek came back on its feet. It was a major undertaking for a few crazy guys that didn't know when to quit. We beat the odds. That had to be incredible to watch all of your efforts actually happening. It was a dream coming true. I saw the salvation of Spring Creek. The retention dike has eroded. A good third of Thompson Spring is now entering the duck pond, which we've got to correct. People are aware of what is happening now. The guys from Spring Creek Chapter of Trout Unlimited, the university, they are backing me to get all the trees and all the vegetation cut off the dike, brush out the area, and make it accessible so that you can reconstruct it. it takes a lot of thought and a lot of effort from a lot of people to get it done. 
And this is what I'm hoping that can, that can happen. famous paintings in the history of this country it is right here. I'm sure it would probably go for millions today. This picture right here is the westward movement, the covered wagon and the oxen. And this was done by Joe Humphreys. His name was there in 1939. Uh, we might put that on Antique Roadshow. <laughs> now here is an interesting, this, this is an interesting fact. This is my grandfather, Thomas Humphreys. My grandfather was in the Civil War. This is the famous Bucktail unit. They were the snipers, the sharpshooters. My grandfather was captured outside of the swamps of Richmond and was held in Bell Island prison for three months. Very few people survived three months at Bell Island because there was nothing to eat. Then he went on on a prisoner exchange and went back into battle and he fought in South Mountain and then at Antietam, he got down in behind a stump, eased himself up over the stump to take another shot and a bullet came and caught him in the mouth and came out his neck. He was 50 years old when my father was born. He survived, and that's why I'm here. I'd say the Humphreys are a pretty strong breed. Yeah, I think I think we have some some grit. I'm not one to quit, and I have staying power. Do you care if I fish up above you here? Are you Mr. Humphreys? I am. I'd be honored just to watch. <laughs> well, thank you. tenacious until my goal is fulfilled. That's a deep hole. But will he do it? Some say yes. I think that he has positiveness. Mm, nice fish. I want to hold this one. Beautiful. Look at the colors, the stripes. Nice fish. Yeah, but he got my nymph. I knew I should have doubled the knot. We'll live and learn, Joseph. We have another shot here. Now here's a par rainbow. Look at the par marks on it. Isn't he a beautiful little thing? I am still going to take a 20-pound brown. If I have to come back from another world to do it, I will find a 20-pound brown. Through the years of knowing Joe, he only knows one speed, 110%. Give it all you got. There is no quit in that guy at all. When I was filming on the White River and on the Little Red in Arkansas, John Wilson was with me, and I hooked what we thought could have been a new fly rod world record. It was an absolutely oh. huge fish, well over 20 pounds. Oh. It was, oh. It was oh. over 30 inches. Oh, huge. I saw him roll in the light, and... The memory still is burning within. It's been 10 years and I'm going back to Arkansas. It's called determination. I'm gonna catch that damn fish. Let me show you something. In 1992, Rip Collins took this 40 pound, four ounce brown trout out of the Little Red River. I've hooked huge fish in this river on two occasions. Both times, they beat me. But a biologist told me either in the Little Red or the White, there could be a 50-pound brown. A 38-pound brown trout or trout would be a fly rod record. I'm still pursuing this record. To take a fish like this would be a dream of a lifetime. water is extremely high, it's flood stage. When my friends inquired at the local tackle shop, they said, go home, the river is unfishable. We got a fish. Wow, that is a beautiful fish, Joe. Pretty, but not big. We need big, we need big. Mm. Yeah, we got some weight on this one. There's a nice fish. Come on, hump, come on, come on. 
when I'm nymphing and I'm into deeper, heavy water, lots of times I'll simply not adjust what I'm fishing as much as I do the length of the leader, and it will make a difference. I will get a little more time on the bottom naturally. Get a big one. Wild Joe. That's a minnow. We're looking for a 20-pound brown. I'm going to try to get down on the bottom. Take it on. I got a fish. Oh, yeah. Nicely done. I just have a feeling that could happen. Mm. Yeah. I thought for a second it might have been a half. Oh, I thought it might have been two. You can't be discouraged in the fishing game or no matter what you do in life. Sometimes we don't understand why things aren't going smoothly, but nothing is easy. You have to be flexible. Looks good. That streamer looks really good. Let's see what they do with this egg. If you're persistent and stay with it, it'll pay off in time. Mm. Not a bad fish. I know there was a reason I didn't sleep in today. Tell your daddy that I'm here. What are you doing out there? You're going down the river. How you doing? I am well too. I caught a trout. <laughs> he knew me, didn't he? he? Called me Joe. December 15th is our last day for the quest of the 20 pound brown. So far, we've been shortchanged, but with the luck of the draw and any luck at all, we may take a heavyweight, which is always the quest. Thank you, John. Thank you. We're going to give it our best shot. I'm not quitting. I'm after that 20-pound brown, and it could be in front of me. You never know when that fish can be caught. the shoals very successfully, and we were continuing to catch fish. First double of the day, Joe. But as the day was coming to an end, we made one more run. That was a good fish. It's getting pretty dark. I had worked all day, and this was literally the last moment before we had to go back. My fly is a large sculpin. It's drifting, and I'm lifting, and it stops. I feel the head shake. The fish goes upstream. They're usually pretty good. It's a heavy fish. This was the trout. This was my dream trout. Yeah, this is a good fish. This is a heavy fish. This is a fish of a lifetime. This fish is so heavy, I cannot move it from the bottom. I've got to stop this fish. There's a stomp in there somewhere. 
Is he still on? I don't know. Huh? Go above him. Does he run you into the weeds? He got you in the, he got you in something. It's gone. Wow. Took me down into the weeds. Holy shit, that was a big fish. Big fish like that, they know the bottom. He went under a, a he, there's a stump or a log or something up there, or the grass. He goes back under. I thought we had him. I really did. When you can't lift a fish, when you can't turn a fish, I've never had a fish that I couldn't turn. I couldn't turn that one. I couldn't put any more pressure on him because he was playing me. But that's something that you hook a fish that big, you don't even get to see him. You feel him. <laughs> oh, my, yes. Yeah, you do. That trout, if we have landed it, would that not have been a real sports spectacular? And we had the chance because we, had, we hooked the fish. God. Just heavy weight. Just like a log. Just wow. like a friggin' log. It was like hooking onto the trident, the submarine. Yeah. And it's running around in the ocean, and you know, you have no control. To take big fish, you can do what you know to do, but you have to have some luck, too. You were really close. <laughs> One of the things that I've done since childhood, I guess, was to decorate under the Christmas tree. Rather than trains or Christmas gifts, my father put together something under the tree, and so I continued the tradition. I get the moss from the forest, and it keeps rather well. It's the American Indians and the animals that were here pre-Columbus. I've collected the animals and the Indians over many, many years. Some of those little figures are probably 70, 80 years old or older. At that time in early America, we had the buffaloes and uh, the Indian here, and he's maybe trying to catch this rabbit. Yeah, well, the Indians have to have water, and, and let's face it, their livelihood depended upon the fish within, and somewhere in my lineage there must have been some Indian blood because I sure do connect with the American Indian and what he went through to survive. I get a kick out of doing it. It's fun. I guess that's the, still the little boy in me. It's a lot easier going down than it is coming up. <laughs> in the off season, when I'm not fishing, hunting is what I really enjoy. There's a couple. You know, you have a lot of thoughts when you're hunting. I think about how fortunate I am to be here to do this. It's hard to believe how time, how quickly it passes. I know that I'm 87, how fast my life is scurrying on. I'm here at the top of a ridge. I was happy and thrilled to be able to climb it. But how many more years will I climb this ridge? Hopefully a few more. At this late stage in my life, I'm still building memories. Whether it be that big buck someday, or simply an eight-inch brook trout on a wonderful mountain stream. 
you always have those things to look forward to. There's a real purpose in life up here. I guess that's the solitary aspect. It encompasses all of those things. These are my reflections when it's awfully quiet and nothing moves. Better get the new hat on my old head. It's cold out there. Turn on the damn heater. January, February, and March can be long, cold months. Here we are in the winter. We've got snow, but I also have cabin fever. Were we the belly of the beast or the shore bed There's times when I just have to be on that stream. I'm going fishing. There's nothing like a beautiful day on a trout stream. It's something that in those cold winter months, it keeps you alive and it keeps you coming back. Through stones at the stars with the whole sky fell. Now I'm covered up in straw belly up on the table. And I drank and sang and passed in the sky. There's one in this corner back over in here if I can get him. We got a fish. But to catch a fish like this, yeah, this is the cure for cabin fever. Yeah, how was that? Without water quality, you don't have fish. And they have to have a food chain. They have to eat. So everything we can do to keep the contaminants away from the clean water, we have to do it. And it starts right here. It starts at home. It starts with Thompson Run. Good morning. How are you? Look at me. What do you think? You look good. There are trees growing in the diversion. They have to be taken out of there so that we can start a reconstruction of the dike. If you can't see what has to be done, then it won't happen. Amazing, Joe. It's a lot better than it was. Put it this way. This is a dream come true to me. That's a piece of the slag right from that old iron furnace. You can see it now. It is mind boggling what can happen when you have a group pulled together to do a job with the right equipment. There we go. There's the man right yeah. here. This was a tangled mass of brush that turned into a lovely area. What a wonderful day it has been. Nice How much we accomplished. 
Stage three will be to get the machinery to the site to further reconstruct the dike. There's a lot of work to be done. And if I have to be that driving force, along with TU, so be it. My father does wear his heart on his sleeve. He treats everyone like family, and he has so many friends. This house, it's Grand Central Station. Oh my God, anybody comes in now. It's always been fun. At any given time, people are at the door, the phone's ringing nonstop. Somebody just stops in for a visit. Somebody comes for happy hour. It's happy hour time. I've said to him before, if you judge a person's character by the company they keep, then he is the wealthiest man I know. That's a filet. We will turn these six minutes on a side. You want a medium rear? Every year the night before the first day of trout season, a group of us have a major happy hour and a major feast. Everybody uh, come out to the dining room table. This is the kickoff of the 2016 season. Here's to the opening day of trout season. Just take a bite of the strawberries and the whipped cream and then chug with the champagne. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. We start in the corner room at 8 o'clock and have breakfast when everybody else is fishing. Two pancakes and a side of bacon. And then we go to the bald eagle. Granums are popping off, I imagine. Now, I've got a secret weapon I, I bought yesterday. Oh, boy. What do you think? Which one? I like that one. I don't know. <laughs> I've been fishing every year, the first day since I was six years old. This is my 81st opening day. Ah, there's my first hit. You taking a rest? I wouldn't miss this opportunity to see you fish. Oh, good heaven. That was fun. We caught some fish. OK. My children. We fish only a couple of hours because we have to be to the hot dog house by noon. So I'm ready for the hot dog house. Everybody did order a Mr. Hot Dog with everything. Jeff, he wimped out and had a salad. And now we fish spring creek, and now we fish parts of the baldy. Here. Andy has a fish. Thing of beauty. Thanks, Joe. You're enjoying cigar with Joe at? right down yonder, and he keeps catching fish. He's always the last one off the street, the oldest and the, the last off. I've had 81 opening days of fishing. 81 years. Some of these trees aren't 81 years. I don't know of one dog that's 81 years old. <laughs> I don't think there's a chicken that's 81 years old. <laughs> oh, I think there's a chicken. <laughs> Shall we run? You know what time it is? Oh, it's a quarter of six. We've got to go. Oh, my, this is, this is frightening. We'll lose our risk. To gyms, we must go. <laughs> Give me a break. All right. Here's the tradition. Here's your tradition. Here's to Joe, our Joe. gracious host. Yes. Great to All of us are going to struggle and, and, and work to survive till 2017. Right. All right. Yeah. Hi, here. Okay. The streams of PA are waiting for you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Good, I appreciate good, that. Good. God love your okay. heart. You bet. Thanks. That is so cool. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. You did much. a great job. Appreciate yeah. it. And I don't want you to get hurt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm over there. Okay. You need to get a shot. Yeah. yeah. As you know, one thing I love to do is going to be tradition. We're going to start now. I want a night fish tonight. Jesus. No, Christ. I'm serious. I want a night fish. You're, you are you're, serious. You yeah, we're serious. going back, and, and I know there's a one spot in Spring Creek. I think we can take fish. 
We went up to Coker's, remember? It worked. Oh, no, my God, we're all exhausted. Why are we? Please, no. This is our first day of trout season. It is. Not so much fishing, it's just being together. A different eating establishments as well as fun on the stream. You were convincing. Yeah. Hey, Tom, I might get after a belt one or anything. Yeah. If people today had to go through what you did to, to figure out how to catch fish, I don't think people would be doing it today. If you let failure be cause motivator. you to stop, yeah, I mean, you, you would have stopped long ago. Yeah, that's what makes it fun. Those fish are not gonna beat me. No matter what happens, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat these fish. I'm gonna make it happen. Like the in the Clint Eastwood movie, the Indian said, I'm going to endeavor to persevere. Oh, trout, you're dead. <laughs> You poor little fellas. <laughs> the green drake is a magnificent insect. One of the largest mayflies we have here in central Pennsylvania. It's an indicator of your water quality. And the green drake is adverse to pollution. A lot of streams don't have green drakes because they don't have the water quality. The green drake hatch it happens once a year. I call it the Memorial Day Classic. It's hard to predict when it's going to happen, and not all fly fishermen are successful. It's such a phenomenon because the life cycle of that fly really stirs the fish into activity. It's one of my favorite times to fish. Mighty stream, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful? It's absolutely, it's, what a pretty stretch. I've heard you say, look up. Isn't that beautiful? That's awesome. That's pretty good. It's going to get more. It's going to get more. They're going to get lower. Take their back on, laying near the lights for the nights of the northern lodges. Oh, nice fish, huh? That's a wild brown. Mm -hmm. If only we could all do this at 87, huh? Yeah. Fish being Greg stand in this stream and throw flies like that. Yeah. Life is good, huh? Life is good. You can follow the hatch, but it's also a great when you hit the hatch in its major period of production. We just happen to really nail it right. Welcome to the Green Drake Hatch. He's a legend. This is what we have been waiting for. This is when the flies are in profusion and the fish are ready to feed. It's an exciting time of the year. I'm going out and catching fish. We don't have enough stuff in Boston, but I think I might be able to take one underneath. I'd love to just get one good fish. There we go. Nice. There we go. This is good. This is what I need. That's awesome. I'm turning. Yeah. That a boy, huh? Yeah, I'll take him. A nice 15, 16 inch trout took the fly. Yeah, baby, that's all I needed was one fish. Green Drake's flying. Fish on. It's a good night, huh? It's a great night. What could we ask for that was any better than that? That was, was as good as it gets, I think. To grow older, you appreciate what you have more. And I think trout streams are fountains of youth. It's that challenge to try to take that fish. It's always a learning situation. I will never lose that excitement of going on a trout stream. Every day on the stream is an adventure. 
and as a teacher. If I've passed some good things on to other people, not only the how-to, the nuts and the bolts of the fly fishing game, but an appreciation of nature itself. That's what it's all about. going to be a day it's going to have a green drake hatch on spring Creek. you can never anticipate which way your life will take you the people you will meet along the way the journeys you'll go on you have to follow your passions in life that's what it's all about Through my life of fly fishing, through a culmination of moments that cast memories, such as a cast in a thicket, a jumble of brush on a mountain stream, when a cast seems impossible, then it happens to see the fly land, then bounce jauntily for a brief moment, then disappear as a brook trout inhales it. This is the moment down deep in my gut, a feeling of satisfaction, joy, and contentment. The melody continues to play through my heart and soul. It's orchestrated by the water and the wind moving the hemlock boughs. Right now, age-wise, I'm uh, 17, 18. I'm having a blast. Beautiful casting. Nicely done. When you were four years old, this is how we did it. Good, good. Beautiful cast. She is following the wonderful casting tradition of all of you. What's they call it? That? How many tickets you got in there? I use this code a lot when I fly. <laughs> <laughs> We are going to land a unbelievable brown trout that will be the new fly rod record. We learned from last year, didn't we? Five degrees at four in the morning. You can't be a wimp and be a night fisherman. Good fish. Oh. Yeah. Look at the camera. That was a big fish. <laughs> These waters are filled with miles of endless memories of my childhood, my family, my career and my inspiration to pick up a fly rod. The springs are my heart. There's waters, the course of my life story. And there's trout, the friends I want to see flourish for lifetimes to come.
class too. Okay. Okay. I had the honor of fishing a Pennsylvania Creek with Joe about nine or 10 years ago. This was a birthday gift from my dear wife. I spent a couple of days with Jedi, Joe, as I called him. He not only taught me something about nymph fishing, but he shared his soul with the love he has for creeks, streams, rivers, fish, and the conservation of all of the above. It was a master class in living life, in harmony, respect, and humility for one's environment. I came away from this retreat cleansed and invigorated and had learned a couple of fly fishing techniques. I shall never forget him in that weekend. Oh, and we caught some beautiful trout as well, all released back to those crystal waters. Who said that? Who said this? Liam Neeson. Oh, did he? Liam Neeson said this. Oh. He's such a wonderful man. I taught him to tie a fly, and he tied a beautiful dry fly, a collector's item. Jedi, Joe. That caught me right in the air. Uh, Dan Wiggle. Then it comes down, OK? What the hell was that? <laughs> it was a mill. We grew up in a mill. That's excuse for my our behavior. Don't you think she sound? You sound like Dad. We do have similar facial expressions, I must say. You can go up the stairs up there and pet the bear. I wrestled a bear about that size. He hooked my leg. I couldn't get out. Joe Humphreys here. Uh, Denny and I had a good day in the stream. I hooked two trout. I don't know what he was doing in there, but I hooked that beaver. I don't know many, too many guys that hook and land beavers, and so I can't put that on my resume as a beaver catcher. A nationally known expert on the art of fly fishing, a gold medalist in our hearts, ladies and gentlemen, fisherman Joe Humphreys.